Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you for the introduction. It's, um, it's really a pleasure to be here today, and uh, there's been some terrific talks. Um, I do want to share some thoughts about green practice in the operating room with you this afternoon. Um, and I will admit to feeling that there are a lot of challenges right now, and hopefully I can articulate some of those challenges to green practice and maybe stimulate some ideas for the meeting next year. A um, couple of quick disclosures. I just spent a very small amount of my time doing some consulting a little bit for Drager Medical and Covidian back in the States. Um, I'm going to start with a little story and just bear with me for a moment. Um, it's about a man who went to Vietnam in 1990 to address malnutrition in the rural areas. Um, his name was Jerry Sternin and when he got there he had six months to do his work. There was sanitation problems, poverty, lack of clean water, and he had a language barrier. He didn't speak the language at all. Um, when he got to the villages, he, um, his first thought was, let me find if there are any healthy kids at all in these rural areas. And lo and behold, he found some children who were healthy. And he watched what their mothers were feeding those kids. And he found that they had unique eating habits relative to the other children. Their mothers mixed some crab and shrimp and some greens in with their rice. And what he did was he encouraged the mothers to hold cooking classes in the villages to show other families what they were doing. And what he found at the end of his six months is that 65% of the kids in those areas were better nourished and they stayed that way. And ultimately, this method spread through the villages and reached 2.2 million people, changed their eating habits, okay? So you may be wondering what the heck that has to do with greening in the operating room. Hang on, I'm gonna try to get to that in a little bit. Um, so let me just back up for a moment and talk about some of the greening activities that are currently underway. Um, the ASA has a task force on this topic. Uh, I wanna recognize um, Charlotte Bell, who chairs the equipment on facilities that runs the task force. Kate Hunk, Susan Rise, and, and Jody Sherman, who have done a tremendous amount of work moving this forward. Um, the uh, task force published a white paper, which is available on the ASA website, and it addresses a number of different areas of green practice in the operating room. Um, talks about the sustainability of anesthesia equipment choices, single-use devices, reprocessing of single-use devices. Um, there's a lot on the um, environmental impact of inhaled anesthetics and methods to manage that. That's what I'm going to concentrate on today. Um, they also, there's also some um, content on pharmaceutical waste and impact on the environment, um, waste stream management for uh, plastics and glass, um, and then finally how we might move to a more LEED certified design of operating rooms. So, um, can't possibly cover all that content in 25 minutes and given the theme of this meeting, I'd like to focus primarily on um, uh, delivery of anesthetics, inhaled anesthetics, and the environmental impact. So um, let's just start with some basics about greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gases contributed to, <clears throat> contribute to reducing heat loss from the earth. Um, they basically get up into the atmosphere, they absorb radiant energy, and they re-radiate it back into the atmosphere, trapping heat and increasing the temperature. Whether or not there's global warming, I'm not going to get into, but that's what a greenhouse gas does. Um, it turns out there's a number of different gases that have this effect in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is the overwhelmingly significant one by virtue of the amount of uh, petroleum-based fuels that we burn. But methane, for all of us meat eaters, we're contributing to greenhouse gases through livestock emissions. Um, and it turns out that the anesthetics um, are also greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide, Isofluorine, sevofluorine, desfluorine all have that effect on the atmosphere. And the relative impact of any greenhouse gas is determined by two factors. One is the radiative warming, how much heat it can absorb and re-radiate, and two, how long it persists in the atmosphere. Um, Susan Ryan published this table in the uh, ASA white paper, which I think is a nice summary uh, that allows you to compare the relative impact of some of the anesthetics. So um, it looks at uh, sevofluorine, isofluorine, desfluorine, and nitrous oxide. You can see that uh, the atmospheric lifetime is very different between all those gases. So sevofluorine at the, is at the low end, lasts just about a year. Um, desfluorine, pretty significant atmospheric lifetime, and nitrous oxide really hangs around for a long time. Um, now the radiative warming factors are not in this table, but um, what Susan did was um, 
put the calculated global warming potential, which is the warming potential of each of these gases relative to carbon dioxide. And what you can see is that they are all much more significant as greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide is. Uh, Siva fluorine is, is the best of all. Um, and this is the 100-year global warming potential, um, which may be a little long for a gas like Siva fluorine, which only persists a year, but not so much for nitrous oxide. And you, there are other factors. You can calculate the 20, the 50, the 100-year global warming potential. But in any event, um, you can see that desflurane, um, by virtue of uh, its long lifetime in the atmosphere, the concentration at which it has to be delivered, and its radiative warming is probably the worst of the greenhouse gases that we can deliver. Um, nitrous oxide, um, also significantly greater than sevofluorane um, uh, and isofluorane in the middle. Um, one of the things I really like about this table is that Susan attempted to put it in terms of miles driven, which I think is a more emotional way for us to understand our impact on the environment. And so for one Mac hour of sevofluorane, she estimated that it's about equivalent to driving eight miles in a car. You could look at one Mac hour of desfluorane at even one liter fresh gas flow, that's 200 miles driving in a car. So um, I think it's something that viscerally we can all appreciate a little bit more. And maybe some of us make some decisions about how we drive and, and our autos and things. So it, I think you can start to relate that to how you might choose to deliver an anesthetic. Um, there is some debate about the uh, overall impact of anesthetics um, on the environment. Um, uh, Sulbeck Anderson did a lot of the calculations of global warming potential. And uh, in his paper, he estimated that the global anesthetic contribution is about the same as one coal-fired power plant or a million cars per year. So on the scale of things, if you put it that way, it seems pretty small, certainly relative to driving cars and trucks around. Um, there are a number of assumptions in his model that may suggest that he underestimated the impact. Um, he used data from the University of Michigan where there isn't as much desflurane used, um, didn't include a total life cycle analysis, and we'll talk about that in a moment, really just focused on the greenhouse effect, um, and didn't include other uses like veterinary and laboratory medicine. Um, his point, and I think it's, it is true, is that Patient needs are more important than the green consideration. So if there's a clinical reason to use a particular drug or agent, that's going to um, be more important than the green considerations. Um, fortunately for green practice, there are some econo economic factors at work here, and that is that um, green practice also goes along with reducing waste and cost. So there's an economic benefit to green practice as well as conferring some environmental advantage. Um, as you increase the cost of trying to follow green practice, though, you need to uh, look at the return on investment of that cost. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, so I'm going to focus for the rest of the talk on the green management of anesthetic vapors. Um, and there are a number of facets um, to talk about in that topic. One is the choice of the agent, um, the techniques that you use, um, whether or not other adjuncts are useful to reduce inhaled concentration. And I, I won't talk about that in much detail because of time, but certainly the use of regional anesthesia or um, other opioid analgesics along with your inhaled anesthetics is going to reduce what you have to deliver. Um, there's been some work around recovering or eliminating anesthetics from the waste stream, and we've heard a lot about technology advances to enhance delivery here today. I won't go into that in much detail, but I do want to touch upon some of the challenges of, of adopting those technologies. Um, so let's talk about green anesthetic choice. So from a pure green perspective, um, sevofluorine or isofluorine, I think, are the preferred choices. Um, they both have lower global warming potentials than desflurane, and the lower MAC value also reduces the amount that you have to deliver. Um, desflurane, um, I think, should only be reserved when there is clinical advantage, and I would submit that the clinical advantages of desflurane relative to those drugs maybe aren't so apparent. And we can have those debates later on, perhaps. Um, but, um, you know, Eager and Schaefer did a simulation with Gasman in 2005. And it, when I read that paper, it was really striking to me because the marketing around desflurane was, here you have the fast-on, fast-off agent for those short procedures. Well, it turns out the procedure needs to go a little while before you even see any advantage for desflurane, probably 100 or 120 minutes or more, depending on how you use it. So 
Longer procedures, perhaps some advantage. How much longer? And, and personally, in my own practice, I have to say that I can, I can do some very long procedures with isoflurane and sevoflurane, manage the wake up very well. So uh, I'm not convinced that desflurane is useful for longer procedures. Obese patients, perhaps, but Jim will tell you in the gas men stimulations that the fat compartment takes a long time to make a difference. So not clear that there's an advantage there. Um, one little aside. Um, we do fetal surgery in my hospital, and we use 18% desflurane to relax the uterus. And at those concentrations, perhaps some, some advantage to desflurane, but very unique population. Um, nitrous oxide, um, another uh, gas that I would raise questions about whether or not we need it. And um, we have a world's expert here, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about nitrous oxide. You'll hear that in a moment. Um, but it has an extremely long atmospheric lifetime, 114 years, and very low potency, so it requires high concentration. So it's a gas that's over time going to have a significant environmental impact if you use it in your practice. Um, so one little aside to, to think about is whether or not TIVA is indeed better or not. And um, I put this slide up here, not so much because I think anybody's ready to get rid of inhalation anesthetics, but Jody Sherman did a really nice life cycle analysis comparing the greenhouse impact of the inhalation anesthetics and propofol. And she included the, the manufacturing costs, she included the transportation costs, the electricity required to run pumps and that sort of thing. And it's interesting because she even included um, a 50% wastage for propofol because sometimes it's hard to draw up the exact right amount and the disposables that are used for administration. But if you look at these plots, on the top is the entire life cycle analysis, which includes the greenhouse gases that are released in the atmosphere as well as all those other manufacturing and transportation costs. And you see that propofol doesn't even appear on that graph. Um, and this is global uh, greenhouse emission equivalents on the x-axis. Um, if you take away the release of the gases into the atmosphere and you just look at manufacturing and transportation costs, propofol still comes out way ahead from a pure greening perspective. So um, I don't think any of us are going to give up our an anesthetic vapors tomorrow. But from a greening perspective, this type of life cycle analysis makes an interesting point about the potential benefits of uh, total intravenous anesthesia. So um, before I get into the, the last bit on um, uh, delivery of vapors, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the recovery and destruction technology that's out there. And this is still pretty early. There's been some demonstration projects. Not all of these products are actually have hit the market yet. There's a variety of different ways that it's being done, um, from cryogenic condensing of anesthetics for recycling to catalytic breakdown. Um, Blue Zone has a canister-based recovery system where the canisters sit in, on your scavenging system and then you return them to the company for recycling. And then there's some very early work um, uh, actually at UCSF on photochemical destruction of these uh, gases before they go out into the atmosphere. But most of these systems have some disadvantages. They're, they're complex. They add complexity. There's some overhead for recapturing and reprocessing. And um, with one exception that I'll get to in a moment, I haven't seen um, any real substantial return on investment calculations for these. Um, and I think that the money right now is in better delivery rather than in um, recovery systems or destruction systems. Um, if we can reduce the waste, we don't need to worry about recovery and those sorts of things. Um, I did just want to mention some of this data that came out of um, Sweden. Um, and they uh, it's really fascinating to me because culturally, obviously, um, the Swedes are very um, invested in, in green behaviors. So the Stockholm County Council actually funded a nitrous oxide breakdown project in one of their large um, maternity hospitals where they give nitrous oxide by open mask for delivery analgesia. And so they uh, put in, actually have, they're now in their second generation system for nitrous oxide breakdown. And um, this was a really nice return on investment analysis um, where they actually calculated the cost in uh, euros per kilowatt hour to run the recovery system. Um, and the metric that they articulated that point, below 0.2 euros per kilowatt hour seemed to be an appropriate place to be. And depending upon the interest rate to pay for the materials and the capital costs and those sorts of things, they could get below that level. So, um, so this 
this was available on the internet and it was the only really detailed sort of return on investment analysis I could find for a, um, a system that would, in this case, break down the nitrous oxide into nitrogen and oxygen before it entered the atmosphere. So let's talk about anesthetic delivery, and um, it is a fascinating topic. We've heard a lot about it today. Um, closed circuit anesthesia, of course, is not new. This quote is from 1926, Ralph Waters, where he describes a simple uh, technique is described for such reuse of anesthetic gas and vapors where an oxygen only is added during the anesthetic, and that in amounts approximating metabolic requirements. If you read that paper, it's really fascinating what he did um, in the absence of pulse oximetry. I'm not sure I would have been one of, would have wanted to be one of his patients, um, but, and he didn't have any outcome studies, but nonetheless, here we are approaching 100 years later and still dealing with the complexity of closed circuit anesthesia, um, which is probably the ultimate green technique. Um, so where are we today? Um, in most anesthetizing locations, I think we're still left with green techniques that are more art than science. Um, I tried to summarize a variety of these techniques um, in a paper a couple of years ago. Um, many people here have described much of this work. Um, uh, the poster by um, Stelling Erickson is, is really very nice in describing how you can, in an artful way, have a green anesthetic. Um, some of the elements of this, um, in the U.S., we have this very annoying habit of doing, um, delivering inhalation anesthetic by mask and then turning off the vaporizer and leaving the fresh gas flow on while intubating. And I don't know why that's become so entrenched in practice, but of course, you basically blow out all the anesthetic into the room by having the fresh gas flow up, and now you have no vapor that you have to now reestablish back in the circuit. So I've spent a lot of time teaching residents to turn off the vaporizer and not the fresh gas flow. And um, there's some nice models that I was able to do through GasMan to show the advantages of that technique. Um, limiting the maximum flow to an open circuit condition. I work in a pediatric hospital, and of course, as we heard before, the open circuit occurs once you equal minute ventilation. So when you have a two or three kilogram baby or even a 10 kilogram child, it only takes a couple of liters a minute. The standard has been 10 liters a minute or more during induction. So using flows that just approximate an open circuit, raising them above that don't really get you anything except wasting anesthetic. Um, Overpressurizing the vaporizer setting and reducing fresh gas flow. Stelling's poster talks about that very nicely where he uses very low flows during induction, very high vaporizer settings um, to avoid waste. And certainly circuits with lower internal volumes are going to allow you to equilibrate a little bit more quickly. During maintenance, um, using minimal flows that are based on oxygen consumption are going to reduce the waste of trying to approach as much as possible a closed circuit. And um, not many of the machines that were in use today still don't return the sampled gas to the circuit. It goes to the scavenging system. But obviously, a greener practice is to return your uh, gas that you're using to analyze concentrations back into the breathing circuit. And then emergence is a little tougher. It's, there's a lot more art, I think, to trying to articulate a green practice around emergence. But this, the coasting technique, um, which Jan has described, where you sort of maintain your minimal fresh gas flow and then just turn off the vaporizer um, and uh, at the end, rather than gradually um, increasing flows and gradually reducing vapor concentrations, which is a technique that's pretty common in the states. Um, and I do believe that oxygen agent concentration monitoring is really essential to be able to artfully do these techniques um, safely and effectively for patients. <clears throat> so fortunately, there is some technology emerging. And um, uh, Dr. Kennedy showed us some more current data than this. This comes from some of his earlier papers, um, where he showed that introducing um, the predictor, something that shows the anesthetist where the drug concentrations are heading will help to reduce the fresh gas flow. Um, and he showed that they went from 2 liters a minute in an earlier audit down to 1.3 liters per minute um, by introducing that tool um, into practice. Um, that's been commercialized um, by Drager um, in the vapor view. Um, they have a, a nice tool, what if, where you can dial in what you might want to do, and it shows where the concentrations are heading. And then um, the dark lines indicate, once you've confirmed those settings, what's actually going to happen. Um, I have the little flag up there to indicate that that's fortunately not available in the United States. And, uh, and we're struggling under some of those restrictions still. 
Um, we do have the low flow wizard in the United States um, that Draeger also um, has on some of their machines. Um, and that does help to guide the um, provider to the minimum flow that's required for the patient. Um, and um, in a simulator study, um, Loria um, and others showed that they, by using the fresh gas flow wizard, they were able to reduce the fresh gas flows by 46%. So it does seem to be a technology tool that does foster more green um, practice. Um, some of the limitations of this is it's not really useful during induction or emergence uh, when gas concentrations have to change really rapidly. Um, and it doesn't really tell you when it's okay to start to follow the recommendations. They just tell you it's a maintenance tool, don't use it during induction. But generally, once the exhaled concentration begins to approach the vaporizer setting, it becomes a very useful tool to follow. Um, then we get into the more automated approaches, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because we've heard a lot about it today, but um, we have these really nice tools now for setting expired um, targets for oxygen and vapor concentration and, and telling the machine the minimum flow. There's been some nice studies um, and even more data at this meeting to document the effectiveness. Um, the GET entitled control, uh, Singaravalu showed a 40 to 50 percent reduction in vapor usage. Uh, Tay reported the reduction in CO2 equivalent emissions, a nice paper to um, focus on the green advantages um, of that technology. Um, the Drager Zeus um, documented, um, Lord Tut Jacob documented a 65 percent reduction in desflurane and oxygen use and 80% reduction in nitrous. And their study was unique in that they also looked at clinical parameters like hemodynamic stability and BIS level and showed there was no difference with the um, automated control in the patient, in indices of patient outcome. Um, so really great tools that are emerging. Um, unfortunately, not available in the US. And, um, and, and actually, the penetration of these tools, I think, is still rather small in the overall market. So there are a lot of obstacles to green practice. Um, we still need data supporting the indications for anesthetic agents, in particular desflurane and nitrous oxide. Um, managing for get fresh gas flow for most of providers remains an art and depends upon the skill and the commitment of the provider. Um, the technology aids that are coming make us less reliant on the art but there's a, both a regulatory and financial barrier to their penetration. And, um, and the other big thing um, that I want to emphasize is that, you know, we've seen nice plots of fresh gas flows and recording what's used in a department, but that requires a champion. It's not automatic that we just get that information. You have to find someone who's willing to pull it out, graph it up, and display it to people. And, and I, I think that's um, an important issue. Um, so let me come back to how fixing malnutrition in Vietnam has anything to do with this today. Um, and that anecdote came from a book um, by Chip and Dan Heath called Switch, where they talk about the psychology of change and what it takes to affect change in, um, in a group of people. And they divide um, the change strategies into three categories, directing the rider um, or enga um, engaging the rational side of a person, motivating the elephant, engaging their emotional side, and shaping the path. And, and the basic um, visual that they use is the person sitting on top of an elephant with a road in front of them to ride. And the rider may understand he wants to go down that road, but if the elephant doesn't want to go emotionally, there's no way that that person's going to drive that elephant down the road. Or if they're in sync and there's 10 roads and they don't know which way to go, they're not going to be able to figure it out. So it's a really nice little metric. And they actually have a great website on, um, that summarizes some of these strategies really well. Um, but in fixing malnutrition in Vietnam, what Jerry Sternen did was he found the success stories. He found the bright spots around the population that were successful. And he used the people themselves to motivate themselves. The mothers that had unhealthy children, they were motivated to make their children healthy. That wasn't a problem. And then he used local people to guide them rather than trying to stand up there as the Western person who didn't even speak the language and tell them what to do. And then he provided simple solutions, so a very clear path. So what lessons can we learn from um, those kind of strategies in terms of how we implement better practices um, for ourselves? So in terms of directing the rider, I think that we still have an education and the better we educate and the simpler we educate, the more we're going to be able to, to engage the rational side. And there's a lot of people who do this well. So finding the bright spots and um, even within a department and having people educate themselves. Um, 
How do we motivate the elephant? This is one I think that's probably the most important. My time is up, so I'm, I'm almost done. Um, motivate, I think this is, this is the most important because you've heard some of the resistance to um, these techniques. You know, why should, I, why should I let a machine do that for me? I'll never know how to do an anesthetic again. You know, people emotionally are resistant to being told what to do. So um, I think one of the fundamental things is a better way to track individual and group performance. So we have to simplify getting the data out on gas flows and displaying it to people. Do we need an app, perhaps, on green practice, where everyone has the app on their phone and the gas flows that are being used in the operating room by all your friends show up and you get ranked on your performance while you're working? <laughs> Would that be a way to motivate the elephant, perhaps? Um, I think um, also the way we're reporting things may not be optimal in terms of average fresh gas flow. Maybe we should be reporting the amount of time you're at variance from the optimal practice. And I think we have lots of ways to create algorithms now on what would be the optimal practice. Um, and then I think reporting what you're doing, um, not just in fresh gas flow or milliliters of anesthetic, but CO2 equivalents are even better yet miles driven, a way to engage people in connecting what they're doing with something that they can viscerally feel. Um, finally, shaping the path. The technology is making it a lot easier. I have to admit that um, as, as much as I love that technology, I think it's still a first world solution and will be for some time. There's 400,000 operating rooms in the world and um, the, those solutions are not going to get to those operating rooms tomorrow. So I think we need lower cost solutions with simpler formulas and technology. And um, last couple slides. Um, so. Uh, green ad management of anesthetic delivery fortunately reduces waste and cost, so we get some environmental benefit too, and that's a good thing. Um, each of us can make a difference in our practice. When you think about a uh, lifetime of anesthetics, 20,000 plus for a busy career, if each one is managed in a green way, many, many tons of CO2 equivalents won't make it into the atmosphere because of your own personal work. Um, I think isofluorine and sevofluorine are the preferred agents. Um, technology makes it easier, but it's expensive, and, and we have to do some additional work in order to make this happen. And I thank you all for your attention this late in the day.